So thanks for watching this lecture on myopic control. I'm Scott Brown, I'm a optometrist based in independent practice in Edinburgh and I'm clinical director of ScotLens, in charge of education lens design. My interest really in, in myopic control has come from practice in ortho-K, so I've been doing ortho-K in practice for around about 20 years. And of course, ortho-K and myopic control kind of go hand in hand. So myopic control started to come to the centre stage in conferences, um, taking over from, we had a long time at conferences, at contact lens conferences, talking about DK over T, and we had a lot of time about eyelid disorders, so myopic control was a real breath of fresh air for me. This is a one-hour lecture aimed at optometrists, dispensers, and contact lens opticians. There is one CET point available, fill in the multiple choice questions at the end, and, and you can, we can submit your CET. So we're gonna cover myopia, we're gonna cover the optics of myopia control with contact lenses and with spectacles. And uh, this is very much from a practical perspective, um, although there's a lot of academic references that are kind of distilled into this from, from research that I've, I've been doing over the years. Now with ortho -K and with myopia control, I've really seen it improve kids' lives. You see parents, have kids and they have a different childhood um, than the parents had wearing spectacles, particularly how active kids are wearing helmets, going swimming and having the opportunities that they have. So it makes a real big difference to, to kids. I've also seen it spark my own interest, but also the interest of the general public and the interest of the, the optometric profession. And I think you just need to see, if you look at any uh, any CET events, there's usually discussions about myopia and myopia control, which shows how, how much interest there is in it just now, which is great. And the last thing, I think there's a really good opportunity for myopia control to really promote optometry to centre stage in a public eye. We quite often work with ophthalmologists and defer our knowledge to them. We work in conjunction with them, whereas this is a kind of refraction and contact lens based thing, which tends to be optometrist responsibility. So it's a real opportunity for, for improvement within the public perception of optometrists with myopia control. Some useful resources that, I've, that uh, I'd recommend. This is not an exhaustive list, but pubmed.com is a, is a great way to get access to peer reviewed journals, either in full text or in abbreviated text. The bhvi.org, the Brian Holden Visual Institute, They've got a really great myopia calculator that can be used either by public or by the profession. And they also do training programs. And then we've got resources in the, opt uh, the optical press. Optician, OT, Eyes Magazine, and then also Contact Lens Spectrum has got a huge back archive, particularly of, of specialist lens, uh, contact lens uh, articles. And then at conferences, there's, there's both Real conferences, so the BCLA, the Global Specialty Lens Symposium, tend to be the two big ones that involve myopia control, and there's also online uh, availability for, for information from those. So getting on to talking about myopia. So we're in the midst of not just a COVID pandemic, but there is a pandemic of myopia going on, and this has been known about for quite a long time. This uh, biographs from this study, the Susan Vitale study was done in the 1970s, over a 30 year period up to the 2000s. And this is the study where the sort of figure the 66% increase in prevalence of myopia uh, was, has, has come from. It's a very well structured, very well cited study. And it shows that uh, across all groups that were studied, which were in the East Coast of uh, America, different social economic groups, both sexes, different ages and different ethnic groups, that uh, there's this general increase in myopia. And it shows that effectively our eyes are adapting to an environmental change because it shows that myopia is changing quicker than the genetic factors. And that's an important thing. The fact that our eye adapts gives us opportunity to control that adaption. Last year, there was a sort of census type data that came from out of China, which showed worryingly that in six, seven and eight year olds, there was a big jump in the prevalence of myopia in the one year, and this is due to lockdown. So this gives us a further clue that environmental factors of being indoors can promote the progression of myopia. When we look around the globe, we can see that there's different levels of myopia. Highest levels are particularly in the uh, East and Far East, Southeast Asia, 
Um, in Taiwan, there's, there's quoted to be 83% incidence of myopia. In fact, in some subgroups, I think it's teenage girls, there's 100% incidence of myopia. It varies around the world. Typically, we have around about 25 to 27% in the, in the UK. That kind of percentage, it makes it a bit easier to deal with patients because there's a degree of expectation. Uh, we, can, we see parents and they kind of expect their children to become, uh, to become myopic and children quite often expect to become like mum and dad. But worryingly, as myopia increases, we can expect by 2050 to have nearly 70% of the population being myopic. And that's gonna to lead to over a billion high myopes, high myopia being over minus six. And of course with high myopia and with myopia in general, there is increased risk of pathology. So glaucoma, retinal pathologies, and myopic macular degeneration. In the short term, of course, not all children have access to a correction for myopia. So this leads to an uncorrected refractive error, or URE, it's abbreviated to. It tends to be in either poorer countries or countries where there's private healthcare and, and, and uh, parents can't afford to, to replace broken, uh, broken glasses or provide contact lenses. And of course, if children go uncorrected, it's gonna lead their attraction to doing more near tasks that they can see properly. So this uncorrected refractive error is now recognised by the WHO as being the second cause of blindness worldwide and the leading cause of partial sight worldwide. And it's not just a level of myopia. What we now understand from this 2019 study is that every doctor of myopia matters. So if we can reduce myopia by one doctor, we can reduce the likelihood of myopic macular degeneration by 40%. So a minus seven myope has 40% less than a minus eight. A minus one myope has 40% less chance than a minus two. So every doctor matters. And that also has a beneficial effect for retinal problems and glaucoma. So we understand that uh, in the general public that we have this condition of high blood pressure. Now it's a condition, it's not a disease, it's a condition that leads to increased risk of death due to stroke or, or heart disease. And of course we have funding and patient awareness of high blood pressure. And, and actually what we need to start doing is promoting myopia so that the public understand that myopia is a medical condition that is gonna to lead to increased risk of myopic macular degeneration and an elderly life potential risk of loss of sight. So myopia is the condition that we need to start to treat to prevent the diseases. And I said earlier on about the eye adapting to the visual environment, and this is the process of emetropization, which we've kind of known and studied quite a lot about, and we learned about in university. So we know that when animals are born, they're born with a broad range of refractive errors, and quite quickly the eye grows towards being emetropic. Now this happens as long as there's a visual stimulus presented to the eye. And we know that in a critical period, we can alter this prescription so we can make, make an eye more short-sighted and then bring it back to emetropic or vice versa. And this hap happens to all eyes in the animal kingdom, whether they have foveal vision or whether they're more primitive and they don't have foveal vision. And it happens even if the eye has the optic nerve cut meaning it's not a brain-related or sort of accommodation processing uh, phenomenon. Um, and it happens even if we laser ablate the fovea. And it happens even if you op serve the optic nerve and laser ablate the fovea. And you can also make one half of the eye grow longer than the other half. So it means it's a local mechanism, or the primary method, uh, mechanism for this is local to the retina and, uh, and, and causing the change. This is relevant when it comes to implementing myopia control. So we can see that from the point that myopia starts, humans tend to develop myopia for about a 12 to 15 year period, stabilizing in the sort of 20s. So we want to really be looking at a myopia control element that's going to be worn into the 20s. Now there are risk factors that affect the onset of myopia. The primary one is parental myopia. Of course, all of our genetic information is coming from our parents. If we have one parent, they have three times the likelihood of becoming myopic. If we have both parents, then we have six times the, uh, the likelihood. Ethnicity, again, with uh, Eastern and Southeast Asian 
ethnic groups having the highest prevalence myopia. We're starting to measure axial length now, and if we have an axial length of 23.19 millimeters or more, then the likelihood is that that eye is going to become myopic. And then the last thing is we have an ur urban environment. So rural people living in a rural environment have lower prevalence and lower onset myopia than urban environments. And this is twofold. It's due to reduced time out of doors and probably also increased near work and near proximity. Then we have this early refractive state that allows us to detect effectively who's going to become myopic. Uh, and this, this has led to the term pre-myopia. So effectively, I hadn't really thought about this, but we're all generally born, children are born hypermetropic. And then you either have too much hypermetropia and you stay hypermetropic, or you become an emetropizing hyperope. So you, you're going to become emetropic, or you can become myopic if you don't have enough hypermetropia. So we can see that if we have at six years of age, if we have 0.63 doctors of hypermetropia or more, then that's uh, that means that we're likely or less likely to become myopic. So we want to have, if we have less than 0.63, then the chances are that that child is going to become myopic. And at 10 years of age, it's 0.19 doctors. Now, this study was from uh, a white Europeans, so it, it doesn't have the, the kind of age bias uh, East, Eastern Asian cultures would have where the myopia tends to start a bit earlier. So this is relevant for practice in the UK. So clinically, should we therefore be doing cycloplegic autorefraction on all six-year-olds and all 10-year-olds? Well, possibly, but I'm a kind of fan of trying to uh, keep children in, keen to come into the opticians and keep it a fun environment, so I'll only want to use drops if it's necessary. But what I tend to do now is with six-year-olds, I'll try and put in plus 0.75 into the trial frame, let the accommodation set on, see if the, if the visual acuity, if the subjective acuity can come up to that point as an indicator, it's just an indicator not thinking of uh, initiating any treatment at this stage, it's just an indicator. So it's at six and at 10, I would put these powers into the trial frame. So that's pre-myopia. The next term that we really want to understand a bit more about is the term progressive myopia. And this really should be a red flag term. Red flag in the same way that if a patient says I've got flashes and floaters, oh, we pick up on that and we need to act on it. So progressive myopia, doesn't have the same immediate threat to vision that flashes and floaters do, but it does have a threat to vision over the course of the patient's life. So this really needs to be considered as a red flag. If we've got onset of myopia before six years of age, then that patient's likely to become a high myope. And the other figure that's important is if we have half a doctor of myopia progression per year. You can see from the, the graph that if we have half a doctor of progression per year, we're really looking at the, the sort of 75th percentile of patients. So these patients are likely to get change ongoing every year until they're in their 20s. So if we do nothing about myopia, we're going to be in a position where for every doctor more patients are at risk of myopic macular degeneration. And by the year 2050, we're going to have a large population of myopes. If we can do something about it, Every doctor is going to reduce the risk of myopic macular degeneration by 40%. And then if we can slow myopia by 50%, we can actually reduce the amount of high myopia by 90%. So this 50% is a real goal and a benchmark. How can we start with this? Well, the first thing is to try and improve public awareness of myopia. So use the term myopia rather than short sight. Promote it to the public by giving them simple, digestible information. And at the moment, there's th around 3 million myopes uh, under the age of 20 in the UK that could all benefit from, from knowing about the condition of myopia. Now, this is a draft uh, uh, example of a draft leaflet, which has got the backing of uh, a number of uh, companies. So it's got Scotland's Avazor, Hoya, Menekin, uh, Cooper Vision, Bosch and Lom, uh, and Contamac. So it's non-commercial, it's just a leaflet that's going to be available through those, through those companies which will come into practice and it will allow us to be able to hand over this information to patients when we see parents that have got kids, if the parents are myopic or if we see myopes we can give it. With an aim to, by the end of 2021, having a million conversations. This 
this uh, public awareness was really spurred by Tom Griffiths, who was a parent. He saw his son becoming, being a progressive myop through his teens, losing his confidence, not being able to, to do things. He then, uh, his son was then fitted with ortho K and Tom's really uh, taken upon himself to try and improve the, the public awareness of myopia. And it's not just going to be a pamphlet, there'll be a website that goes with it. And of course, you can uh, try and convey this information yourselves, but it'd be better if we have a, a, an industry-wide campaign that improves the public perception of uh, myopia. Hopefully with the aim to get government intervention to, to improve things from the point of view of funding and education. So let's talk about lifestyle and the urbanisation of our lifestyle. Time out of doors is not only enjoyable, um, but it's really beneficial for the eyes. If we step right back and look at hunter-gatherers, hunter-gatherers have no incidence of myopia. From the study that I spoke about earlier on, in the States, 25% incidence of myopia in the 1970s, and that had gone up to 44% by the years 2000. And this is before pocket-sized screens and the advent of the iPhone, which started around about 2007. We then have the study from last year, again, the census study from China and lockdown, where there's this jump up to 20% in the six, seven and eight year olds. So time out of doors is a really important lifestyle change that we should, uh, that we should work towards. Interestingly, you now vitamin D is not, not a cause for, for myopia, but interestingly, myopes have 20% less vitamin D than, than, than emetropes. So they're spending less time out of doors and producing less vitamin D. Now we know that outdoor time inhibits myopia, even in the presence of near work. And you can see from the graph here that it reduces the risks. So if both parents are myopic, time out of doors, and this study showed two hours a day, uh, reduces the risk of onset, bringing it down to equal to having just the risk of one parent being myopic. So it's quite a significant before the age of onset but it's also effective after myopia has developed. You can see that this study showed that in the outdoor group, again, doing two hours a day at, at uh, extra break time uh, at school, there was only a quarter of a doctor progression per year versus 0.38 progression per year in the control group. Mechanisms for this are not fully understood. It's speculated at this stage that, that the eye is most sensitive to 555 nanometers of light, which is present in, in daylight conditions. It's also thought that it might be to do with the volume of light, the amount of light that we get. <clears throat> and the light, uh, the light of that stimulus seems to stimulate a dopamine reaction and dopamine might also be associated with the prevention of uh, myopia progression. Dopamine, of course, is also released during exercise. So it's difficult to, to, to separate light from exercise dopamine levels. So what should we be doing? Well, we should be recommending two hours a day is the, is the goal for, for, for patients. Sounds like a lot, particularly I'm in Scotland, so it's dark in winter for quite a lot of time. It you know, could be a kind of borderline on child abuse to force your kids outside. But uh, um, considering that a lot of kids will spend a number of hours on screens, uh, two hours a day is the, is the goal that we should go for. And this, of course, is universal advice. It's free for everyone to, to, to offer their kids. Try to avoid screens in an outdoor environment, so no screens in car journeys, uh, and try to move the, the viewing distance of screens away. So if kids can broadcast something onto a TV screen that's across the room, try and encourage kids to do that rather than stay and watch a screen that's, uh, that's on the tip of their nose. I think a really important message about outdoor time is that Whatever we do with myopia control, um, whether we have a, a device in a contact lens or a device in specs or, or drugs, whatever it happens to be in the future, we should not allow that to be permission for lack of outdoor time. Outdoor time should be the core of the myopia control message. And this is really why um, I'm such a fan of Ortho K. So from a quality of life point of view, Ortho K scores uh, that 60 percent of patients prefer them over soft contact lenses and soft lenses of course are preferred to specs but this image is uh, my youngest daughter and she will uh, she will in between brushing her teeth and go to bed if it's dry outside she will run out into the garden and swing and climb uh, on her, her climbing frame catching an extra 10 minutes of daylight and 10 minutes of outdoor activity um, even after the day is meant to be over and of course 
with good eyesight, with ortho K, without having to think, oh, I've, I've taken my specs off, where are my specs? She's just free to do that. So, um, uh, so that's one of the reasons that I think ortho K is, it removes a barrier for kids to be able to have these, these moments and do it. And of course, there's no downside. If kids are outdoors more, they're gonna be fitter, they're gonna be healthier, and they're gonna see better. So let's move on to the optical, the optical strategies for myopia control. It all kind of started with ortho K. Anecdotally, practitioners were saying, well, we're not seeing, uh, having to adjust the lenses for, for kids. And then the Lorex study, which was published by Pauline Cho in uh, 2005, showed a 47% reduction in axial length. And this study really has gone on to spur and f uh, generate a lot of funding and interest for for hundreds of myopic studies that have gone on since then in 2005. So it's been around for quite a long time. When we have myopia, we effectively have an eye that's too long and a cornea that's too steep. So if we look at this example, we can see we've got a corneal curvature of 7.6 and we've got two doctors of short sight. If we can flatten that cornea uh, by 0.4 of a millimeter, uh, we will reduce that short sight and this is what we're going to aim to do with ortho k but it also is the same principle behind any contact lens so if you've got a soft contact lens on the eye again you're flattening the first refractive surface of the eye if it's a gas perm it's the first refractive surface so it doesn't matter whether it's a contact lens or whether it's ortho k with ortho k we fit a base curve of a lens that's not the target that we're going for with the cornea we'd actually fit a base curve that's probably 0.1 or 0.2 millimeters flatter than our target uh, and that then has the effect of, of giving the correct corneal curvature and taking away the short sight. Now, this is quite uh, reliable. In fact, the study that I did in practice uh, a number of years ago, there was a 93% success rate with the first fit of lenses, meaning that the base curve correlates well to the amount of myopia that we're correct correcting. So if the base curve of the ortho K lens doesn't change, in the same way that we don't alter the power of a soft lens, because when we're, we're alter the soft lens, we're just changing the curvature of that lens. So if the base curve of the ortho K lens, then it's a good indication that myopia is not progression. If we have, look at peripheral refraction, and this is when we have a non-myopic eye, we can see that the image shell that's created from the light going into the eye falls on the retina. And the retina in a non-myopic eye is relatively spherical. Unfortunately, when we have myopia, the eye is more prolate, so it's shaped like the pointy end of an egg. And you can see that we have the image shell falls in front of the, the fovea, giving us blurred vision, but it falls behind the peripheral retina. That image shell falling behind the, the retina is, is one of the issues. Of course, in myopia, what we do is we then put a spectacle or a contact lens on, which pushes the image shell back so we can see the foveal vision that comes into clear and we get clear acuity and that pushes the peripheral refraction further away and that stimulates the eye to grow longer. So what we need to have is an optical strategy where we have centrally, we have foveal correction and then peripherally we have less minus prescription and that effectively means that we're having an add in the periphery. So if we look at it on the corneal, we have central vision and then we have peripheral vision with a different power. Uh, and this of course is where ortho K came from because if you look at the power profile from the topography of a post ortho K wear, you can see it's similar to what we're wanting to, to create. In addition to ortho K, we can have any distance, center, bifocal or multifocal, whether it's gas, perm or soft lens, or similar kind of technology that's starting to come into spectacle lenses. If we look at contact lenses, you can see we've got the left image is ortho K. The second, uh, second image from the left is a, is a gas permeable, so it's a pro curve multifocal from Scotland, which is a distance center multifocal. Of course, there's no prescription limitations with this, so it can handle high sills, high prescriptions. We've then got the third image is the Biofinity D lens, so a distance center multifocal. And then the image on the right is the MySight, which is a sort of concentric ring pattern uh, designed to be independent to, of the pupil size. So pupil size should have less effect on it is the principle behind that. Now I've shown you topography already, but topography is really good and not the point of view of ortho K of it. It shows us exactly the, the refractive change that we've made to that patient's cornea. So we can take a baseline map, look at the car map, and then it shows us the difference. Um, but 
Topography is also usually associated with keratoconus and screening for keratoconus. But it, we are getting incredibly accurate measurements of the eyes. You can see here the Ks to 0.1 of a millimeter, HVID, pupil size. But the other thing that we, we can see from topography is we can actually look at the visual axis and compare that to the center of the cornea. So in these images here, you can see the top image, the optics of the lens are skewed off to the right hand side. The white circle is the pupil. And this patient has a large angle lambda. So the lens is a soft contact lens, it's a micelle lens, it's sitting on the middle of the pupil, uh, sorry, sitting on the middle of the cornea, but the patient doesn't look through the middle of their cornea, so they have a large angle lambda. And of course that would uh, explain why if the patient can't see very well with the quality, they're not looking through the right part, of the, the optics of the contact lens. Whereas the image below, you can see the lens, the patient's looking pretty much central through the lens, and they're gonna have a good acuity. So topography can reveal why you sometimes get poorer acuity with your multifocal soft wearers. You fit one patient, they get on great, 6'6", six, six, N5. The next patient comes along and they don't see well at all. And quite often it's the angle lambda and topography shows us that. Let's have a quick look at these prescriptions. So this is over a time scale for 10 years. You can see if we were looking at this patient, Plano, Plano, and then a small cell correction coming in 2009. 2010, again, small cell prescription. 2012, oh, there's a there's a kind of a bit of a change. We're starting to see myopia creep in here. And then 2014, you think, oh, hang on a second, this isn't just myopia, this is uh, this is something strange. And then by 2016, we can see that there's a large cell has crept in there. But if we had to sort of wave a red flag at one point, it's probably here that we're gonna think there's something else going on with this patient. Um, if we compared the keratometry and we were taking accurate Ks, you can see that, well, we get a jump in the, the Ks. There's a bit of a change in 2060, 2008, um, but it's not really until 2009 where we see a real steepening of the steep K. Um, and actually, depending on how, how accurate you think your keratometry are, you might even leave it until later at this point where you think there's a really big, or there's a significant change going on with the keratometry. Now the advantage with topography is that if we look at the topography, we can see that we would identify that there's the start of keratoconus at this early stage when the patient is still plano. So keratoconus is now a preventative condition uh, with cross-linking, which is available throughout the, the UK on the NHS. And we should really be screening all young patients that have any refractive change with topography so that they don't go on to develop keratoconus with the debilitating vision uh, that it has and the dependency on complex contact lenses. So early detection is absolutely critical and it needs to be topography that's gonna, that's gonna enable us to do this. So we don't know Everything about this peripheral refraction, that's kind of what's so exciting about myopia and myopia control. We don't know exactly if there's a correct distance diameter. Should we have concentric rings? Should we have varying power? Should we have a uniform ad power? Do we want to have a high ad? Uh, will we get to a point where we can measure the power profile of the patient's retina and then marry that in with a contact lens? It's all a kind of exciting times. But there's a huge body of evidence now around it. You can see there's over 200 studies published just on ortho-K with myopic control. And the collaboration is that we're starting to see a 40 to percent or around about 40 to 60% to re reduction in myopia with multifocal softs and with ortho-K. And we're now also seeing the FDA approval in the States of my site which means that there's now devices on the market that have gone through scrutiny that are reducing myopia control. So it's no longer just a theoretical product. It's, it's actually it's been established as happening. If we look at studies, we can see that there's round about similar uh, reduction rates between ortho-K and with soft contact lenses. And Mark Bullimore, who wrote about this in uh, 2019, I think it was, or 2020, showed that it's the, the underlying mechanism behind either bifocal, multifocal, soft contact lenses, and it's the underlying corneal power changes that we make with ortho-K that are responsible for the myopia control. 
And many of the clinical trials that have been done have been done with effectively presbyopic corrections rather than specific myopia control. So it's the underlying this distance center multifocals that, that make it work. And from a contact lens point of view, as long as we are ensuring that we're providing the patients with the same visual acuity in distance, um, then there's not really a downside to putting a, a multifocal optic onto the cornea or onto the, the lens. So this 50% uh, reduction in myopia, how do, we, how do we explain that? So if we take two groups, um, we've got 100 in each group, and then we look at them in, after a two-year study, if the control group, they have an increase in 100 diopters of myopia, then if we had a 50% reduction in myopia, then the, the test group would have an increase in 50 diopters of myopia. So that's the 50%, but it's averaged out over the 100 people in each group. And the problem with that, of course, is that we might have one individual that has progressed all of that myopia and everyone else has been uh, unchanged, or we might have a position where everyone changes a little bit. And this information on how the patients respond is not really published in the clinical data. And I think that this is really important. It's important when it comes to us in practice and possibly doing combined treatments for myopia control, we really need to know um, whether we're expecting to see a result over everyone in general a little bit or whether there's people that are just not going to respond. Uh, so as, a, as an industry, I think we should be asking for this split of uh, to know what patients responded and what patients didn't respond within the clinical studies. And will we see this 50% happen? So if you look at the the information from the Brian Holden Visual Institute, we can see that if we look at ortho K, the red line indicates what would be expected for this patient who started at minus one at the age that they're at. And they're expected to progress to minus 2.43 doctors of myopia. If we can slow down ortho K by, in this case, they're saying 43%, then they'll only progress 1.81 doctors. So that's it's a, it's a good amount, but it's, it's hard to necessarily measure in practice. Fortunately, with me doing ortho game practice, I've got data on patients. So this is, uh, this is data from a study of 51 eyes uh, from the ortho K, the nocturnal ortho K wearers uh, fitted in practice from the age of five years old. The average age of this group was 12. The average starting prescription was minus 175. And they'd worn the, the lenses on average for five and a half years. Now, interestingly, we often associate now ortho K with myopia control, but only 14% of the patient database is under 18. So ortho K is really a lifestyle beneficial for contact lens related dry eye. Most of my patients are over 18. So in the group, what we saw was the dark green bar was patients where there was no change at all. Uh, versus a little change up to one doctor and then one to two and then over two. Now there's no, there's some downsides with this data, there's no control group. So I'm comparing it against the, the BHVI normal as to where we'd expect patients to go. And it's also looking at the BOZR change off the nocturnal lenses. So it's not, it's not a cyclopudic refraction, it's not axial length, it's looking at base curve change. But as I said earlier on, that correlates pretty well. And interestingly enough, when patients were fitted, all of the patients showed less than half a doctor base curve change in the first four years of wear. So if you don't see base curve changes, then you're kind of seeing myopia control working. So from that perspective, if we're not seeing base curve changes, then you are seeing, you're confident that, that something's happening with myopia control. So over the whole group, or group of 44, so that was wearers of more than a year, they showed an average of 0.73 doctors of progression which was 47% less than would be expected from the, the BHVI calculator. Looking at a smaller group within this, so waiters of five years, now this was a small group of only 10, average age of fitting was 11, starting prescription minus one, but, but this group only showed an, or showed an 82% reduction of myopia, only progressing 0.32 doctors compared to the, the 1.8. So can we see myopia control happening in practice? Absolutely. We should be able to see it happening. 
So of this group of 10, six had no progression at all. Three only progressed or progressed up to one doctor and then one, one, uh, one patient prog uh, progressed one doctor. But they all benefited from the myopic, from myopic control perspective. So if you'd like to learn more about Ortho-K, there is an online CET lecture, an hour-long lecture like this on Practical Ortho-K, available through scotlands.com. Now let's talk briefly about on-label and off-label. So as products come onto the market, they're starting to be registered as being for myopic control. So they would be on on-label products. But when we talk about spectacles and contact lenses, the, uh, there's a number of standards that they're made to. The main standard is the manufacturing standard, the ISO, the international standard, and uh, it tends to be 13485. And this is the, the standard that ensures that component parts within, the, uh, within your medical device are made traceability, those kind of things. Then we have other standards, so a CE mark, or in the States, they have FDA approval. And CE and FDA work quite in quite different ways. So the CE mark, is really more an indication for use. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're proving that your device is going to work. And to some extent, extent where we have a 50% reduction in myopia, that's beneficial because uh, you can't guarantee that your device is going, to, is going to cause myopia reduction. So an indication for use simply means that uh, your ortho-K lens is intended for the correction of myopia and then possibly also the correction of myopia control. So things will, as, as uh, in Europe, as things get re, recertified, myopia control will be added into the, the indications for use. But basically, if you've got an approved product, it means that the benefits for that product outweigh the side effects. Now this uh, flow chart was taken from the, the clear ortho case study. Now I've added the box at the, the top right hand side in the green. And I'm sorry the print is very small, but uh, one of the things that, that's evident from this is that it's the eye care provider's responsibility to ensure that the myopic control is being uh, administered properly. You can see that the bottom left green that I've highlighted is the on-label option effective. So we need to have an understanding of how effective something should be. So in the information that I've given you about the, the nocturnal ortho K, we should see something happening. If we've provided a myopic control device and we don't see something happening, then we might want to consider changing the, the, the mode of correction. Uh, and what I've added at the top, I think is an important point to consider with myopic control is, is are we selecting advice for the primary reason of myopic control? or is there a significant cost to the patient? Because that's when their expectations for myopic control uh, go up, if they're paying significantly more. And of course, we get into terms where there's very proprietary, specific, and hopefully there'll be more devices come in the market, technology that's gonna control myopia in different ways. And of course, they will have to prove themselves and go through clinical information in order to, to establish the fact. And they'll be, then be on-label devices. So I think if we're using multifocal lenses or we're using ortho-K, then we don't need to worry too much about the, the on-label, off-label. We want to make sure that we're providing the most appropriate mode of correction for the patient. So some examples that we've got. So in soft contact lenses, we've got daily disposables. Now at the moment, we've got MySight and Natural View, which are, which are both uh, CE approved for myopia control. Now, we might, uh, they, they're both, so my site is a proclear material and that should is a hydrogel lens, so they have lower decays. So we might be in a position where we see a slight hypoxic change or, or redness of the eyes that we think might be related to lack of oxygen. So this would be where it would be appropriate for us to move the patients away from their, their on-label product into, a, for example, a bioaffinity or a distance, a, a distance center soft contact lens that's gonna have similar myopic control effects, but you're going to provide more oxygen. And then monthlies, we've got bioaffinity or customs, and then we can also go into gas perms. So if we've got particularly high myopes or higher prescriptions with lots of astigmatism, then we shouldn't forget that a distance center multifocal gas perm can be a very good option for patients. And then ortho-K, we obviously have to have topographers and we might start to see axial length measurement coming into topography and instrumentation. 
and uh, and there'll, there'll always be more training available on this as things develop. Now with contact lens wear, whether it's soft or ortho K, there is of course risk that goes with that. And the risk is, is really of microbial keratitis. And the risk with contact lens wear is stated in patient years, usually in units of 10,000 patient years of wear. So with ortho K, the risk is 7.7 .7 infections per 10,000 years of wear. So if we had 10,000 patients, we're gonna see 7.7 .7 in one year. So tell your patients the information about risk. They can work out whether the risk is high or the risk is low. And of course the risk can be minimized with, with good hygiene, with good care products. Uh, but they should also be aware, which acts as a motivating to look after things properly, that you can end up losing vision if you end up with a scar on your cornea or with, with a bad infection. It can lead to loss in sight. So make patients aware that there's risk with contact lenses and they need to keep up good, good hygiene. As optometrists, we should be making sure that there's, there's very minimal staining on the cornea. There's very few microbes can penetrate an intact epithelium. And, and preferring to use preservative-free solutions is, is a way of uh, preventing any solution reactions and minimizing staining. Now, as I said earlier on, every doctor of myopia that we don't prevent is going to increase the risk of myopic macular degeneration. So the risk when we weigh it up, this is Kate Gifford's information, uh, is if we have uh, an eight-year-old starting to wear a myopia control device, that's that's the risk of a contact lens wear from, from that patient is less than the risk of then becoming myopic and going over a minus six. So as clinicians, we should be confident to proactively recommend myopic control contact lens wear to younger children. But of course, contact lenses are not always an option. And now we also have the added option from this year of myopia control specs. So, from the ortho K, we can see that we can see myopia control happening. So we want to have similar expectations from the, the myopia control specs. So with ortho K, 100% of all of the patients in the first four years didn't show a power change, a base curve change with their, with their, uh, their ortho K lenses. We also want to consider an option that's going to be suitable for the patient to be worn right through until their 20s. Specs do have the poorest quality of life scores when it comes to lifestyle and, uh, and freedom. But of course, not everyone is able or not everyone is happy to have themselves poke their fingers in their eyes to get lenses in their eye or have somebody else do that for them. So there's absolutely a place for specs. And we've tried various things with specs in the past. So under correction was the first thing, giving a partial prescription or not giving the full prescription or part-time wear. And these have been shown to actually accelerate myopia um, by 16 to 20%. So gold standard advice would be when you start to prescribe glasses is that they get worn full time in the same way that we pres prescribe for hypermetropia. But of course, if motivation is low, I think it's, it's important that we don't get parents creating a lot of angst with the kids about their glasses because they will naturally progress anyway. And once they get to a minus one, a minus 150, their motivation to wear their specs will go up. Um, Bifocals, and again, I showed you the slide before with bifocals, and they are fitted with the bifocal segment on the lower pupil margin, so they're fitted higher than, than standard. But bifocals have really been shown to have a fairly small benefit, and uh, the benefit seems to come in the first year with bifocals, and it doesn't really matter whether there's base in or base out prescription. But now we've got a better option with uh, Hoya MyoSmart lens coming onto the market, showing a 60% reduction. And later in 2021, we're gonna see the Estelar Stellis, which has been quoted to have a sort of 67% reduction. And these have kind of similar principles to the contact lenses. So they have a central area of correction and then they have some peripheral, a uh, different refraction in the periphery. We're using, we're using in the, the MyoSmart, it's little dots of plus three add. Uh, and this was intriguing technology, brand new out, and uh, it's called DIMS technology. It's sim similar in principle to the peripheral image shell we see with ortho-K and with, with soft contact lenses. Um, but if you put the lens on a facimeter, the top image is the, the central image. You can see that we've got a nice clear 
uh, image of the, the Fasimeter Myers at minus two. And if we move peripherally, you can see that we just get a blurry image. And uh, so I was interested to see this a bit more, so so did a video for symmetry of it. You can see that's so zooming in. We're going to move the lens now, so we're doing the refraction to the periphery. And then if we zoom in to the ad, we get a very strange effect happening. So instead of us getting a second image that's clear, we get this kaleidoscope image of a virtual image pattern that's being correct, corrected. But this virtual image looks quite regular, it's quite linear. And uh, it may well be this virtual image that's being created in the periphery that's, that's causing the success. If you do this with a single vision lens, you just get a blur. There is no, there is no virtual image created. So certainly a point of interest and something new going forward that might be able to improve the myopia control. And of course, we may, if it's, it's a pattern that we want to create, this may be available on a laminate, like a Fresnel prism that we could put onto any spectacle lens. So options we've got. Well, first and foremost, good myopia control, I think starts with good outdoor time, two hours a day. Again, this is free for all kids. There's no side effects that come with other than getting wet and cold. Uh, but it does have probably limited compliance. We're not going to ensure that all patients administer this and follow through properly. If we look at ortho K, then it typically costs patients around £40 a month, which is working out about £480 a year. We do need to have topography and practice to do it, so there's additional expense and expertise needed in the practice. And patients have risk of contact lens wear. Uh, one of the advantages though with ortho K is you tend to get full compliance. Patients are getting their myopia control correction, the optics of it, 24 hours a day. Um, and, and again, no barrier in going outdoors. With my site and daily so there's increasing competition with this, uh, which is a, a downside from an optometric point of view, which forces you sometimes to put your prices down. Um, and patients have the same risks of, of, of contact lens infection. Good compliance, and again, if they're wearing the lenses on a full-time basis, they've got the visual, the visual effect there all the time. And if we look at MyoSmart and uh, spectacle correction, that's specifically myopia control, there's an increased cost, certainly similar to OrthoK, compared to, uh, uh, to, to the NHS glasses. And then specs, of course, are at risk of damage, delay getting repaired, and possibly repeat repair costs. So the, uh, the compliance may not be as good with specs as it is with, uh, with the contact lens options. So we need to be realistic about our, our, our business costs because we're going to have to be investing in this, in myopia control for going for the future. And the future really starts with public awareness. If we can generate public awareness, then that's going to lead to funding from a point of view of individuals and also hopefully government funding and support for opt optometry. And I'm sure that technology is going to come in. If we think about kids in a school environment doing proximal work, uh, and then also doing proximal gaming and, and time online for recreation. If we can change that visual environment, then there's scope that we can be causing less damage, uh, uh, both in school and in recreation. And this, uh, this image is from a, a headset study, which was to establish that headset use did not promote myopia, which was the case. But you can see there's actually opportunity there. The two images on the right are the virtual, real, uh, the virtual world, and the two images on the left are the real world. And you can see that we're in a position where we, we can reduce accommodation, possibly stimulate certain wavelengths of light within headsets. headsets. I'm sure technology is going to come into contact lenses. It may even come into to our brains with things like Elon Musk's neural link. If we can upload our school education and a tenth of the time it takes us to be there, we could spend the rest of the time being outdoors. And then we may also be able to manipulate our, our genes, but these are all things for, for the future. So implementing myopia control just now, we've got some great options and the evidence is there both from the point of view of in research and also from the point of view of regulated products on the market. So we're now in a position where we should be offering myopia control. 
pricing. Pricing is unfortunately still quite a high, uh, a pr high price point for the general public. And the profitability, well, we're going to have to invest a lot in optometry, uh, keeping things going uh, or, or, you know, over as things develop with instrumentation and, and, and education and expertise. So whether we choose to put things onto a monthly care plan, whether that's spectacles moving on to care plans and providing a monitoring and follow up, there's different ways to implement this. And if you speak to your suppliers, they'll be able to advise on, on, on how things should be done. And again, having this million conversations and increasing the public awareness is going gonna, is gonna to help, hopefully, to, to, to generate government backing and scope for NHS appreciation of myopia and, and reducing it in, in the UK. So we do need to be res realistic about the costs and the cost that myopia control is going to incur for ourselves, our own businesses, and then also from, from suppliers. And patients as well need to start to uh, really appreciate the fact that, that uh, optometry is leading the way with this and, uh, and hopefully they can apply the same sort of financial uh, value that they, they put on to s signing up for, for games and, and, edu um, and entertainment packages as they, do, as they do their own eye care. So in summary, that's just covered the, the learning objectives that are shown. We've spoken about myopia and its development, the effects, the optical effects of myopia and myopia control principles, the contact lens options, whether it's ortho K and soft contact lenses and spectacle myopia. So thanks for watching. Submit your CET for, or submit your multiple choice questions if you want to get your CET. And if you'd like to check out any other videos, they're available on scotlens.com. Thanks for watching.